Hello, it's Jen Talk. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. This week, my guest is my good friend, Ellie Honig. Ellie is a senior legal analyst at CNN. At the Southern District of New York, he prosecuted federal cases involving organized crime, human trafficking, public corruption, and violent crime. Among his prosecutorial successes were convictions of 100 members and associates of La Cosa Nostra, including bosses and other high-ranking members of the Gambino and Genovese organized crime families. But this program is called Booked Up, not Locked Up. So Ellie is here today to talk about his equally stellar writing career. He is the author of the national bestseller, Hatchet Man, about former Attorney General Bill Barr, and has a new must-read page turner out now called Untouchable, How Powerful People Get Away With It. It was Ellie in Untouchable who broke the story about how the federal prosecutors decided not to charge Donald Trump in the Stormy Daniels hush money case. Yes, the very case that local prosecutor, District Attorney Alvin Bragg, chose to pursue. But There are some differences, and Ellie and I will get into all of that. And he pulls no punches when it comes to critiquing Attorney General Merrick Garland. Okay, let's dive in. Hey, so it's so good to see you. It's great to see you, Jen. It's been it's been a long time since I've actually seen you, and we are coming from our respective home bases. I'm in Jersey, you're Massachusetts. It's, you know, the last time I saw you, what, what I had this flashback to, could it be, have been the fall of 2019 when I was visiting at Harvard Law School and you came to speak to the class? We went yes. to dinner at that cool place in Harvard yes. Square. And then I have this memory that somehow, were you looking for candles and we had to go to the Harvard Coop? Was it candles? What were you looking for at the Coop? <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely would have been looking for swag for my kids. I'm sure oh. of it. Um, so I, candles, my daughter's into candles. So that could be, I do remember I was looking for something very specific. You're right. I remember that. Um, <laughs> I saw you then. And can I tell you a strange memory I have yes, uh, yes. Of, of walking around Harvard Square with you, which is relevant <laughs> to a, a different book, not to come on your show and promote a different book. No, please but, do. Um, we were walking around and you pointed out one of the buildings was the Sackler something or others, uh, you know, the, the yes. Sackler Center or the Sackler Museum, Museum. or something. Uh-huh. And we talked about how that was the family with all, you know, at the head of the um, Purdue Pharma, I guess it is, or whatever, you know, the opioids uh, manufacturing industry. So I'm now reading a wonderful book. I'm halfway in, uh, I think it's called Empire of Pain, about yes. the rise of the Sackler families. And it's riveting and it's so good. But I de- yes, I came up to Harvard and taught your class, but you came to my, my first book party also, which was after that. I did. And I brought my whole entourage. I brought my yes. friend Jill Greenberg, the photographer, and Paulina Porskova. Yeah. yeah. Um, you just said to me, you emailed me and said, I'm going to bring my friends. If it, Is it okay <laughs> If I bring my friends Jill Greenberg and Paulina Poroskova, and I was like, no, 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 don't bring them. I mean, <laughs> that was pretty cool. And Paulina Poroskova, who everyone knows from her days as a model, but she is a, a brilliant and interesting person. Like she defies the stereotype, you know, the stereotype we had when she was a model in the 80s. I mean, um, she was wonderful to talk to, um, and she's written a book herself, which I guess yes. maybe you'll talk to her about. Um, she's really a remarkable person. I really uh, I was, tell her to come awesome on the show. Me. That's I yeah. I reached Get out to my friend yeah. who, who who then reached out to her brother, who then reached. <laughs> it's like I just need to go to Paulina directly. I think yeah, seriously, time I'm, I'm in she, here. she's very but approachable. Yeah, I like her too because she was talking. Um, I know you care a lot about women's rights. I can see that come across in the way you talk about Thank sexual you. assault in the book and just the way you are. Yeah, and you know. She has a really, um, she talks about aging and I think yeah. she looks fantastic. Instead of going through this kind of like turn yourself into a clown through <laughs> extra cla- uh, plastic surgery stuff, not to judge yeah. people who do it, but sometimes it gets, you can't actually control what the surgery does. She's just aging gracefully and, mm-hmm. you know, gorgeously. But anyway. It's a big, a big cause of hers. And like I said, she's also sort of about, uh, you know, going beyond the superficial and, and, and T- telling your story and not just being a pretty face. She's more than that. So, well, you are more than a pretty face too. <laughs> and I want to, I want to get behind the superficial because one thing I always do when I read books is I look at the acknowledgements. I love and that. if I were honest with you, one reason why, I, you know, a person would look with a big ego is to see if you're mentioned. But actually the other reason why, why I uh, look is because I want to know what this person was thinking when they were writing and who their influences are. Yeah. Um, and in the acknowledgements, there's someone you thanked um, 
that I was really touched by. Someone named Gloria Mastropolito. Oh, my goodness. How do you pronounce her last name? Gloria Mastropolito. Yep, you got it. Tell me about, she was your babysitter. Tell me why she was so influential. I got to tell you about two people because I got to tell you about my grandmother next, but who I also mentioned in, in the in the uh, acknowledgments. Writing both the acknowledgments, grandmothers. Yeah, I have two. I'll tell you about both actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, Gloria Master Polito was my babysitter. Um, my parents both worked, and the, I'm the oldest of three boys. And from probably age two or three until I was, I don't know, fifteen or something, because my brothers would have been. 12 and nine, she was our daytime babysitter. So we would come home from school and she would be there. Gloria was old school. She's, she's passed away, but she was old school. She would smoke, chain smoke cigarettes in our house and it. out front. Um, <laughs> and she would, she would watch her soaps. She would watch days of our I lives. I had this babysitter. Oh my God. Exactly. Yeah. She, she wore a, like a, like a, her main piece of clothes was like this gray, um, I don't know how to describe it, but like a gray over, like a sweater, like a long gray sweater that she would pull over whatever, whatever she was wearing. And she was appropriately tough with us because we were three pain in the asses, but she was wonderful and warm to us. And just, you know, I, I think of her like a grandmother. And when I was probably in kindergarten or first grade, she got a set of pencils made for me, which were engraved with, with the phrase Ellie Honig, future author. And keep in mind, this is 1982 <laughs> or something. This is right. now you can go on the internet and do it in 10 seconds and they'd show up at your door tomorrow. But this must have taken, I don't even know how she did it. This must right. have taken her serious, serious effort. So I, I had to mention her in, in the acknowledgements and thank her for that. Quickly, to mention my other two grandmothers, my father's mother uh, was a Holocaust survivor. She was a Polish Jew who was was lived through the absolute worst of it, Was survived the concentration camps, barely mm-hmm. survived, um, and then came here and, and had my father. And she lived until 2008, and she was tough as nails, um, never talked about the Holocaust. You know, some survivors will talk about it. For her, it was she was deeply, deeply traumatized, didn't want to talk about it. When mm. I got, speaking of you and Harvard, when I got into Harvard Law School, she said, uh, okay, what is that and where is it? Uh, and I said, no, uh, no. And I showed her. I remember I drew <laughs> a so map. Funny. I drew a map. I said, well, here's New Jersey where you live. And if you go up here past New York and Connecticut, and she said, that's too far. Um, <laughs> so that's number one. Um, and... Uh, so, so that was my one grandmother. My other grandmother on my mom's side was really a, also a sort of trailblazer. She was a um, she went to Barnard College, and she was a writer and an editor. And she was a copy editor. And I mm. remember her. I still can envision. I think I say this in the acknowledgments. She would have these printed out manuscripts, I guess, and she would mark them up. She had this blue pen, and she would use the proofreader signs for capitalize, you know, all the symbols. Yes, I stuff. know them. I love yeah, those signs. Like, I don't know what they are, but like, I still can see those documents hanging around her house. So she was um, really, there were not a lot of women in the publishing and editing industry at this time in the 50s, 60s, 70s. She worked at Yale uh, as well. She was uh, a, a, an assistant to, I forget the, the man's name, but he was a prominent history professor or something. So she was literary too. She she also passed away in uh, 1999. So they're all gone now, but all very much, as you can hear, still with me. I did. I just. I, I just love that. I also love like that. You know, that's that's too far away. I haven't. I haven't heard <laughs> of the place. And there's the last person I want to ask you about is Rachel. Oh, I think I gosh. met her at the book signing party. Y- yes, you um, would have. Yeah. And she's like, of course, incredible. Um, I love the glasses she was wearing. I remember they were pretty cool. But I, she does I, one, have cool glasses. Yeah. One thing I remember about her though is that she, at the time, maybe still works for the DOJ. At yeah. the SD, Southern District of New York, is that right? Is that where she uh, is? Or? So almost. So she was at the District of New Jersey. She was a few miles okay. away across the river. But, you know, I just give her credit because I don't know how she puts up with all this crap. Yeah. This crap being me and what I do. Yes. Um, because how? So, on the, so first of all, before I went into media world, we were prosecutors at the same time. And uh-huh. that is so challenging. I mean, we, our kids were young. My kids now are 15 and 17. But at the time, they were two and four or seven and five or whatever. And we're trying cases overlapping or back to back. It was incredibly challenging. I had a long commute. She had a longish commute. I, you know, we live in central Jersey, so I would have to go up to the city. She would go up to Newark. Somehow we pieced it together day by day. Um, and it was, it was tough. Um, when I went into the media, you know, my first book is all about Bill Barr, a negative yes. book about Bill Barr Hatchet while my man. wife is working at the Justice Department. That's what I wanted to ask you about. I mean, 
Wow. So let me say a couple of things. My wife never once complained. And my second book uh, is about, again, largely about DOJ. She left uh, DOJ a, a, a year or so ago. Okay. Um, but, you know, nobody ever said anything to me or to her. Nobody ever told us, Nobody ever told me, hey, you can't slag Bill Barr. She never said to me, hey, you know, I'm working at this department. And nobody ever thankfully punished her because I was a little bit afraid knowing the way things sometimes went in the Trump administration. And we know he watches TV. He, I'm sure he knows who I am. And I, I'm often, but not always, but often critical of Donald Trump. Um, I was worried that somebody at DOJ might get a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, get rid of, you know, demote her or or don't give her the a promotion that she's entitled to. And I will say, not only did she continue to move up the ranks at the U.S. Attorney's Office, but she became the acting U.S. Attorney. She was the head of the New Jersey office for about a year, as she should have been. So, you know, so of course, my evil mind just thought, huh, I think I know how she got those promotions. She told people, wait till you hear what he was going to write until I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much room there was to even tamp, tamp it down, but yeah, right. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I love this book. I mean, in terms of the structure, I think it's, it's so well done because you work through stories of your days prosecuting and new ones, not the same ones from Hatchet Man. And then you also kind of compare them to Donald Trump as a kind of mob boss himself. Yeah. But then you move toward, move through some legal analysis. Um, and let me just be clear, since the name of the book is Untouchable, you're kind of, without hitting us over the head, going through the reasons why certain powerful people appear to be and actually are untouchable. Yep. And I, I really like that part of the book. And then you move toward at the end, what I would call the fantasy indictment of Donald right. Trump. <laughs> right. But in the analysis, I I only wish this book had come out before I wrote Big Dirty Money because <laughs> you, you add some information and some insights that, um, you know, as much as I talked to prosecutors writing the book that I just didn't have. I mean, yeah. nothing you said contradicted what I wrote, but it added color. And I think this is, it's truly essential reading, I think, for anyone who wants to go into criminal law work, but also anyone who works in organizational systems, like in the corporate world yeah. or in businesses, to kind of understand the spoken and unspoken ways that people with power get a lot of opportunities to mess up and people with little power often have their rights trampled on. Um, and you yeah. make that really, really clear in the book. How did you decide to structure it um, in this way? Oh, that's a great question. So the way this book came about is Harper Collins, who I wrote my first book for, said, what do you want to do next? I said, I don't, right. I don't know. And they said, well, what do you get asked the most? I said, oh, that's easy, right? How the hell does he get away with it? And he is most often Donald Trump, but not always. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way we set the book up, it actually opens with some, after uh, an introductory chapter where I describe, describe a mob case that I did. And by the way, as you see, I mean, I love to draw on my own experience as a prosecutor, especially in mob cases. The amount and clarity of the parallels between what mob bosses do and what many powerful people, but including Donald Trump do, is even surprised me as I was putting this book together. Um, I actually opened the book with a bit of original reporting, which has become way more relevant than I ever thought. I give the inside story of what happened in the Justice Department of the Southern District of New York when they were deciding whether to charge Donald Trump with the Stormy Daniels hush money payments. When let's, I wrote let's it- Let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah, when I wrote it, when I did this reporting, which has been since confirmed and, and, and matched by various other outlets, um, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was, well, this is part of the historical record that's never been fully told. Turns out that case has come roaring back to life as we've seen in the last couple of days. Um, here's what I found in the reporting and, and reported. In 2018, when, when the Southern District of New York, where I used to work, not in 2018, I, I left there years before that, they were prosecuting Michael Cohen. And they, we all know Michael Cohen ends up pleading to campaign finance yeah, and a, other crimes. He's been a guest on the show, as a matter of fact. Exactly. Right. I've been a guest on his show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we know that Michael was convicted. He pled guilty to the, the campaign finance and to other financial and tax crimes having nothing to do with Donald Trump. What I report is that they, now at that point, 2018, DOJ and the Southern District of New York knew they could not indict Donald Trump because he was sitting president. It's a longstanding DOJ policy. I actually talk about the policy yep. a bit in the book. Um, but in writing up Michael's charging documents, they were, the SDNY wanted to lay out chapter and verse on everything they had on Trump, which was very damaging. And just before I go further, it's important to understand the, the internal dynamic here. 
the SDNY is a U.S. attorney's office, which is part of the United States Department of Justice. The SDNY, and I write about this in the book, is famously independent. People a lot of times roll their eyes at us. They think we're arrogant. There's maybe some truth to that. Um, institutionally arrogant in that we think we can do whatever the hell we want and we don't have to get anyone's permission. So there's always this natural tension between the SDNY and technically our bosses at what we call main justice. I tell stories in the book. I said, the only time Preet Bharara ever got mad at me was when, when he was my boss and I said something like, well, the bosses are coming up from DOJ. And he went, they're not our bosses and we don't work for them. <laughs> I was like, yeah, And just okay. to make clear to people yeah. who might not be familiar, although I think folks are, yeah. main justice is based in Washington, D.C. Right. right, And so if like you think about this in the, like if you think about this like a corporate headquarters thing, it would be the equivalent of like a corporate headquarters maybe being in Delaware or probably, or let's say corporate headquarters is in New York City yep. and, and it's for some movie studio, but the California division gets to do whatever it wants without think- checking with corporate. Like Think that. about it this way. Think about it yeah. like from the office. We were Dunder Mifflin Scranton and main justice was corporate. Right. That's sort of the way to think about it. You know how Michael Scott is always going, oh, corporate wants us to do this. We don't want to do that, you know, and sometimes defying corporate. So that's how we were at the Southern District of New York. Mm-hmm. And, and there was this was a this is a famous, well-known phenomenon. So when main justice sees the Michael Cohen indictment or which became an information technically a little bit different, but they saw that SDNY had laid out all the details on Trump. They don't call him Trump. They call him, you know, you're always going to call him candidate one or whatever, individual one in this case. Individual one. Yeah, actually, this this is actually the story of how he becomes individual one. And main justice, and this is again under the uh, under the Trump administration, but actually pre bar uh, before Bill Barr gets there, main justice says, no way, we're not putting all this information in there about Donald Trump. Now, look, it, you can take that as they, they don't they want to protect Donald Trump, which uh, there certainly is some of that, but there also is a legitimate argument, and they, they had a heated back and forth because main justice was saying, we don't put in extraneous detail about someone who's not being charged in this case. The SDNY was saying, but we have to tell the whole story. He's an inextricable part of it, and we don't want it to look like we're pulling punches because he's the president. Ultimately, this was, a, and I detail this, a, 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 an intense but substantive back and forth, and ultimately, though, as much as the SDNY is independent, we're not anarchists. We have to listen to the bosses. And it got pulled out. And if you look at Trump, the actual Michael Cohen document, ch- charging document, it barely mentions individual one just in passing. Now, later in the case, the SDNY actually went with a just do it now and ask for permission later uh, approach. And they did drop lines, which are now being quoted, into Cohen's sentencing, where they say Cohen acted for and at the direction of individual one. So just um, to be yeah. clear, so like the, this, the Southern District of New York had one case against Michael Cohen, if I recall correctly, mm-hmm. and then D.C., the U.S. Attorney's Office there, had the other had the other case involving maybe the, the tax evasion. Line to Congress. Comes, line to Congress um, yeah. and so on. In this case, the part where... Donald Trump is referenced, when it gets excised, almost all of it out, you still see this individual one who uh, Michael Cohen was working under the direction of um, in order to make these hush money payments to Stormy Daniels, no, right. referred to as by her her real name, Stephanie Clifford, Stephanie Clifford making yeah. these payments. Um, and the reason why, though, in part, that this was unlawful is because it was a campaign finance violation, the thinking being that right. 130000 exceeds the amount of money you can give to a candidate mm-hmm. and that this was done as a, as a kind of um, in-kind contribution by getting her to be quiet. Exactly. Um, and it had obviously value 130000 to help not ruin his chances of getting uh, elected. And this is like in October, right around the time of the um, Access Hollywood yep. audi- audio that's leaked showing uh, Donald Trump saying that he happily sexually assaults people because <laughs> uh, when you're a star, they let you. Right. Right. So this is, so this was, that's happening. Yep. But when you mention the later document, the later document is when you go to get, what people don't always remember or know is that when you, as you're saying, when you go to get sentenced before the judge, there's another opportunity for yeah. the Justice Department to not just be literal and bare bones about things, but to speak in this document. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about what that looked like? Yeah, and in that sentencing document, again, this is months after DOJ, Main Justice has tamped down the indictment itself, the information itself. DOJ puts in the sentencing letter, and at, at this point, and I have the reporting on this, the Southern District said, screw it. We're not asking for permission this time. We're just putting in this statement. Now, they do qualify it a little bit, and people do need to in- include this. The, as, it's not quite right. First of all, some people say the SDNY called Donald Trump an unindicted co-conspirator. That's not correct. They right. consider that. That would have been much more dramatic, but they, they decided on their own, the Southern District, that we're not doing that. 
Mm-hmm. And in the part of the sentencing memo where they say Cohen acted for and at the direction of individual one, that's actually, there's important prefatory language where they say, as Cohen acknowledges. So they're saying, well, Michael Cohen has said this. We sort of, we, they're, they're more or less adopting it as their own. Now, the other part of my reporting is when you get to January of 2021, now it's clear right. Trump is leaving office. He hasn't accepted this yet because we're about to have January 6th, but it's clear to every rational person that he's leaving office. Now the SDNY has to wrestle with this difficult question because now he's about to become indictable and they have a series of internal meetings and we know the outcome. They decide against charging him federally. And there are various reasons for that, but I guess it boils down to a combination of they felt like the conduct itself wasn't serious enough to sort of break this barrier and bring the first ever indictment of a former president, combined with they thought the evidence was sufficient to indict, enough to indict, but not overwhelming, um, combined with the fact that they were aware of, as one person phrased it to me, the prudential concerns with charging an ex-president, that it would be politically charged, that it would be divisive. And they sort of blended all three of those in, and there was actually a fairly wide consensus. There was no person at the SDNY pounding the table in lone dissent saying, this is an outrage, we must charge it. Um, now, look, they, they thought he was going to get charged for January 6th. They thought he was going to get charged maybe for Mueller, uh, a bunch of other things that never came to pass. So that all is but I wanna, relevant now. But I want to, yeah. timing-wise, because this is what's so interesting to me in your mm-hmm. book, um, mm-hmm. timing-wise here, um, and so, since we're, fresh, we're focusing kind of in on um, the legal ramifications beyond Michael Cohen going to prison of these hush money payments. And, yep. you know, you and I are talking, it's it's Thursday, April 6th, just two days um, after the indictment's unsealed and folks will be yep. listening on Sunday. So when you're listening, it's just a few days after that. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in the timing of what you're talking about because you talk about, okay, so January of 2021, we have right. a new president um, uh, and we and obviously we no longer have Donald Trump's um, Attorney general. By that point, Barr had Barr had resigned. Barr was gone in December, yep. and yep. there was. I'm now in the, there was an acting AG. Yep. And he was then gone. Was that Clark? Monty I'm Wilkinson. To, oh, okay. And now there's someone. But I'm sorry. Before the, under um in, in in December, who was the acting? Oh, for the very Clark, end right? of after Barr left. Yes, Je- uh, Jeffrey Rosen. What? Jeffrey oh, Rosen. Rosen. Jeffrey yeah. Rosen was there. Okay. And then after Jeffrey Rosen, when when Biden's in office. Is this the time that Audrey Strauss of the yeah. SDNY, so she's taking that moment to decide, okay, he's indictable now, let me decide. Right. Why in the world didn't she wait until there was a new AG? Was That's she trying a great, to clear the decks for So him? it's a great question. Um, Audrey Strauss, who was leading the SDNY, and she's a career prosecutor, um, if anything, um, not a fan of Trump's personally and politically. She took over when Trump and Barr got rid of the U.S. attorney, who they had chosen, Jeffrey Berman, a few months before the oh, election. Right. right. But right. they were originally trying to install this other guy who had no prosecutorial experience at all. They met him on the golf course. You know, he was some like yes. um, hack. And they and and because Jeffrey Berman resisted, they ended up putting in Audrey Strauss, which is the way it should have been. She was the number two. She elevated. And so she's the U.S. attorney at the SDNY throughout all of this. Um, right. There's a good question. Why wouldn't she have waited? I mean, look, she made these meetings happen both before and after Trump left office. They straddled that January 20th line. Um, What's interesting is the SDNY made this decision themselves. And nobody, once Biden took over, nobody, not Monty Wilkinson, not Merrick Garland, not Lisa Monaco, the deputy AG, ever called the the SDNY and said, hey, what are you guys doing on this? Where are you? Are you going to charge Trump or not? It just... Audrey Strauss and her team said, we're not charging them. And it, it was let lie. It was never raised again, as far as I know, and as far as I reported in, inside DOJ. Well, so that was interesting to me too, because once someone else came in, you mentioned this, Will, someone named uh, Williams, who was took took over. Oh, Damian yeah. Williams. Damian yeah, Williams. He's, he's the new US, he's the current U.S. attorney. Sure. And that's where you say, you know, there was never, no one, there was never any further discussion. Yeah. And, you know, I find I have to say um, just because so Audrey Strauss, Strauss makes this decision and then it just sits there. That's it. It's no, done. Nobody it's has done wanted deal. to kick that hornet's nest. Audrey Strauss knocked the hornet's nest down and and let it sit there and nobody's wanted to come up and kick it is the, the short version. And I pressed the, uh, the SDNY. I wanted a comment from Damian Williams uh, as to whether he had ever decided to reopen it or reconsider it. And 
I was politely but firmly told he's not going to be commenting on that. So all I can say is there's no evidence that I've seen in the public reporting sphere that he ever took another look at it. And if he did look at it, then we know what he decided because there's never been a federal indictment of Donald Trump. What's really shocking and and disappointing to me, though, in this front is that we know that these payments were made into, what was it, 20. Was it 2018? Into 2017, the, late 2017. 2017. The, the, the um, reimbursements of Cohen, yeah. Reimbursement. And so, although there's a special statute of limitations stretcher over in New York, obviously we know that the statute of limitations, which is five years for the federal crimes, they burn through that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I, I, I want to, because of where, you know, I, even though, um, even though Merrick Garland wasn't, in office when that decision was made. He, he's in charge. He's the boss. Right. And all it would take is saying, hey, I'm curious. I hope that anything that was closed off uh, before I got here, that we that we have a clean slate here and we, right. and we take a look at this. You know, you can say something like that because we know how bosses have power. And uh, I just want to... I just want to jump into, because I love that you don't pull any punches. There's something you say on page 253 of the book. The chapter is called Waiting for Garland. (laughs) And I I can read it, or if you'd like to read uh, it. Go ahead, you do it. Are you sure? Because you've already read this. Uh, If you want to hear Ellie read this, you'll have to buy the audible. Is it the town? Yes. Okay. All right, good. I like this part. I'm proud of this part. Okay. Okay, I'll read it. (laughs) You can. can, uh, can, Oh, you you want to do it? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, unless you want to. Do you want to do it? No, go ahead. You do it. I'll listen. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's this great scene in the Ben Affleck movie, The Town, where moments after they've committed an armed robbery, four Boston area thugs jump out of their getaway SUV holding bags of money and long guns, all wearing identical scary nun masks. Suddenly, a uniformed Boston police officer in a marked squad car, seemingly on a routine pol- pol- patrol, unwittingly pulls up next to them. The cop looks at the armed robbers, quickly calculates what's happening, and then turns his head away from them in an, I'm going to just pretend I didn't see anything here manner. Moments after the near confrontation, as members of the heist crew flee the scene, one asks, what the fuck was that? Another answers, he didn't want to end up on the wall of the VFW. The bad guys know that the cop understood his predicament. I can tangle with these guys, but it's going to be ugly and difficult and dangerous. Or I can just pretend nothing happened. Turn away and go about my day safe and unbothered. The cop in that scene makes me think of Merrick Garland. (laughs) Holy shit. First of all, so first of all, you have a future as a VO person. That's an excellent reading. You have a good reading voice. Um, I appreciate you. <laughs> oh my god! I, 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 yes, I'm laughing because that scene is so great, and it's a pretty harsh criticism of Merrick Garland. But I stand by it, of course. And I think you look the way that he refused to, as far as we know, never wanted to touch anything relating to Stormy Daniels or Mueller. How about Mueller? We're also oh, focused. Please. Yes. I mean, it's ancient history now, but but it's in your book. You can talk about right. it. I mean. Robert, we all know what happened with Mueller, right? Bill Barr spun it. Mueller didn't make any specific recommendations. Bill Barr lied to us about what was in there, and that was that. Merrick Garland would have had every ability when he took office in early 2021, March of 2021, to say, okay, folks, this is all still within statute. They didn't do their job. They never looked at it, or they it got distorted. Here's the team. You're looking at, at Mueller, you're looking at Mueller, and you're at least making a recommendation to me as to whether there's anything there. There is zero indication that Merrick Garland has ever done any such thing. In fact, I don't know that Merrick Garland has ever even acknowledged that the Mueller investigation happened. And that's another example of like the cop in that scene, him pulling mm-hmm. up and being like, you know what? It's easier if I just look away and and move along. And now, you know, there was a long time there was a heated debate happening on mostly on Twitter about is Garland doing anything on January 6th or, 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 well, classified documents sort of came up later. Um, But my answer, and I say in the book, is he's clearly doing something. He always has been doing something, but he's moving at a galactically slow, myopic, bureaucratic pace. And then Mm -hmm. he appointed Jack Smith, which I think was the right move. He should have done it earlier. And you see the the, the difference. It went from like driving 10 miles an hour in a beat up Ford to like, you know, driving 120 in, in a Maserati, like Jack Smith. Jack is- Smith should have been appointed right. at the end of March. Exactly. Because I would have come into office saying, listen, because if his priority 
is to not make sure the DOJ isn't politicized and he wants to save the institution. But as I wrote at that time, you know, it's like the Tylenol scare. There's poisoning in the on the shelves. You got to do something about it. If he'd appointed a special counsel then, that would have been the thing to do. But my my understanding from people like you, I haven't talked to you about this, but people yeah. who are on the inside think, you know, it depends who you surround yourself with. And he wasn't surrounding himself with people who were going to say that to him. Yep, I think that's right. And, I, I think there was a, a an institutional... Um, reluctance at DOJ. And and the complaint that I make, the criticism that I make, one of the criticisms I make of Garland is he always has this mantra that we've heard him repeat a million times. We start at the bottom and we work our way up. I argue in the book that was never going to work. You're never going to flip the the guys who stormed the Capitol (laughs) and broke windows, the face painters, the, you know, the people (laughs) with bear spray. They're not going to know anyone who can even get you to Donald Trump. It was always a flawed approach to this. Why on earth? It's not like it's any, look, who is Jack Smith subpoenaed since he's been in office? Mark Meadows, Mike right. Pence, Pat Cipollone. It's not like it was ever any mystery that those folks had relevant information. So on day one or day eight or whatever, Merrick Garland should have said, we're, we're going to subpoena all these folks. Look at Cassidy Hutchinson. I talk a lot in the right. book about Cassidy Hutchinson, yes. right? right? They had, when Cassidy Hutchinson testified <laughs> last summer and blew all of our minds yes. with what I took to be very credible, yes. very powerful testimony, Merrick Garland's DOJ didn't even know who she was. They watched at home on their TVs with their jaws on the floor. And the fact that Merrick Garland got beat to the punch by Congress on her, and still she didn't even really come in until several months after that, that is just poor prosecution. That is an inexcusably weak, myopic investigation. So look, DOJ may get there, but also let's be practical here. Let's say Jack right. Smith gets a charge. And by the way, Merrick Garland has to approve any, any charge that Jack know. Smith wants Don't to bring. Don't even get my heart going. Well, again. let me yes. tell you, I think it's likely Jack Smith recommends charges on one or both of, of Mar-a-Lago and January 6th. I think Mar-a-Lago is more likely. But Garland still has to, has to approve. And now the, the law says that Garland is supposed to give great weight to Jack Smith's recommendations. And if he overrules them, he has to report it to Congress. But um, the problem is it's 2020. It's the middle of 2023. And, I know. you know, I, I said this the other day with the with the Manhattan DA case. They're not going back yep. into court till December. That means you're not looking into a trial until substantially into 2024. I don't think a judge, I think there's a very good chance that a judge goes, there's no way I'm having a criminal trial in the middle of the 2024 primaries. That's what and concerns debates. me. I, did yeah. you read, the, I went in, because I was worrying, worrying about this. I went in and read the transcript and they actually talk about that. The earliest a trial could be set is January and, the, and they're thinking, they're thinking spring, but they're not even until December having the hearing on the motion to dismiss the yeah. indictment. I, I would be, there's no way you're having a, Jan, you're no, there's no way you're having a I next know. appearance in December and then a trial in January, maybe in the spring. But again, let's say the judge says we're going to do this in April. You, you're in the middle of primaries. You're coming up on the convention. Like, I don't even mean from, I do mean part a little bit from a logistical point of view, but that's not the concern. Yeah, the concern Merrick is, Garland is running the clock, unfortunately. Yes. Um, let me ask you, I want to go back to the Mueller report for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I, you know, since it's come out, I've become, you know, we, we've all become much more familiar and I become friendly with Andrew Weissman. And I sometimes think, what if I had been in his job or it must have been very hard to be sitting there watching this go down because the convoluted language that Robert Mueller oh. decided to include in the report yep. left the door open for Bill Barr to do what he did. Absolutely. And yeah. I will tell you, the yep. minute the Mueller, the minute Bill Barr got on television um, that day. And when I read his yeah. letter, the minute I read his letter, I thought, this is great. They found a crime. I could read. I'm a lawyer and I could read that. Right. But the press, not you, but like the rest of the press was like, I guess there's nothing here. I'm like, are you looking at what is happening here? He, I mean, you could, I have the receipts on this. You can go back to my, what I wrote in Politico. Right. I was like, what is, what's going on here? And I just feel like, I just feel like what went wrong with the Mueller report um, wh- why it could have been so different. And I, if yeah. you want to talk about the OLC memo as part of this, but I I, I, I just wonder what you could have done, anyone could have done differently um, if you were working for Mueller. I fault Mueller and I fault Barr. I fault Mueller out of probably good intentions and Barr out of bad intentions. Mueller refused to say, look, he couldn't have charged the president, that's for sure. But I think he absolutely could have said, and based on all of the above, I find that this is, sufficient to charge a crime and that he can be charged with obstruction or whatever other crimes may have been in there. Instead, Mueller gave us this bizarre double speak um, where he says, I would, if I could exonerate Trump, I would, but I can't, so I won't. 
but I won't tell you where I landed. And he leaves us in this nether world where it's kind of clear what he's suggesting because he does exonerate on conspiracy charges, but not on obstruction. And that leaves the floor open to Bill Barr. Not only does Bill Barr write this completely misleading four-page letter, and in the book I lay out several of the ways why it's misleading, he's such a liar, and I call Bill Barr a liar in the book, um, which I don't do lightly, he then, Barr then hold, do you remember, I'm going to put you on the spot here because it's interesting okay, to good. see people's memory. Do you remember how long it was from the moment Bill Barr issued his public letter until the moment when we in the public and Congress actually saw the Mueller report and were able to compare and contrast? Do you remember how much you time was? the first version of the one that we saw that was, had redactions in yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the very first okay. time. Yeah. I can remember this. So I believe, wait, don't tell me that I'm yeah. wrong until I screw it up. <laughs> I believe it was March when the letter came out, and I don't think we, I know that Mueller testified at the end of July, like right. July 28th, so it was sometime in between there. I think it might have been four to five weeks. It was, you 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 passed. It was 27 days. So Bill Barr was savvy enough, manipulative enough to let his account, his four-page BS letter be the only thing yeah. we had for a month, basically. And in that time, everything calcified. Republicans around Donald Trump, Donald Trump declared victory, everyone go home, nothing to see here. People who wanted to see the full report had nothing to look at. And by the time the full report came out, it was kind of over for the most part. Um, even Nancy Pelosi had sort of moved on. She was like, eh, we're not, we're not going to impeach her. They never impeached on this, right? Um, and that is an example. And here's another thing about how, just how much of a right, liar. Right, let's just be clear. We're talking about what also bothers me. There's volume one and there's volume two. Yep. Volume two is where most of the action was right. because it the seems absolutely clear. There are pl 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 plenty of grounds for obstruction yep. and very little defense there for yep. sure. On volume one, that also got distorted. Yes. Because, it, you know, people keep saying there was no evidence of um, conspiracy. Right. Um, Right, right, or no evidence of you know conspiracy to defraud through election interference or whatever. Right. But that's not what it said. It said that there wasn't enough evidence to charge. Uh, you right. know, I just well, here's what the report I, said, and yeah. and this is a good example of of what Barr did. The report says the following: It says, one, Russia absolutely interfered in this election. Two, they did it because they wanted to help Donald Trump win. Three, the Trump organization knew about and welcomed. That, uh, that interference. And four, at times, members of the Trump organization tried to reach out and get that interference. However, Mueller writes, I do not find that this amounts to a federal conspiracy crime. And Barr just gave us everything after the however, which is wildly misleading. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, but the problem we all face, um, and this is what you talk about you know, Trump's next book should be, you know, art of the delay or art of delay. Right. And it's everyone's best tactic when, you know, feelings are strong and people have the pitchforks out or are angry. Anything you can do to appease, um, you know, or lull the crowd, eventually they're just going to, they're just going to gonna forget, right? Yeah. No, I think that's right. I, th I think people want to hear what they're going to hear. And if you, delay <laughs> is a very powerful tactic. And we're seeing it now with Donald Trump. We saw it with, with, Bar, um, you know, if you draw things out long enough, it's it, it can really change things. And I, I talk quite in the, quite a bit in the book about how Trump uses a lot of the tools of the presidency, executive privilege, for example. We're seeing it now to drag things out. Although I will say this, there's been a real change in the courts because the early executive privilege fights where Trump was invoking executive privilege to try to block testimony in the Mueller investigation and the January 6th investigation, those were taking months and years to play out. The Don McGahn subpoena took two years. And I right. and others would get on the air and say, there is no reason this needs to take this long. I know the courts are backed up, but a judge can move a case as quickly as he or she wants. And if you, you know, hey, judges, how about if you get a case that goes to constitutional separation of powers, you move it to the top of the docket, right? And right. ever since then, we've seen judge, we've seen decisions on executive privilege being made within days, right? The recent decisions on Mark Meadows, on Mike Pence, we are getting decisions from trial courts and appeals courts in a matter of weeks, which I think is a major change and a major improvement on the way our judges are can doing we, their jobs. Can we talk about the, uh, sorry to cut you off, but the Mike Pence thing. No. Um, yeah. So this is really big and important news because he was challenging having to testify before the grand jury that yep. Jack Smith is bringing. And he was using, I think, two grounds, one executive privilege and one speech, speech and debate. or debate clause. Yep. What, Remind me, which is a court ruled, I think it was kind of a so, split ruling a little bit. So Pence actually argued speech and debate. Tr 
Trump came oh, right. in from the outside and argued executive privilege. That makes sense. Trump lost executive privilege as he always does. The courts rejected that. Pence was arguing that as vice president, I was also president of the Senate, and therefore I should be protected by speech and debate, which basically says members of Congress, and it's been applied to their staffs as well, but members right. of Congress can't be subpoenaed basically in other matters. And the decision that came down, which we now know Pence is not appealing, is you are protected, Mike Pence. You don't have to answer questions as to the performance of your job as the Senate president. But I think a lot of what prosecutors are going to want to know, most of it is going to fall beyond that. And he will have to answer. For example, what was his, what were his conversations with Trump in the days leading up? What were Trump's efforts to pressure him? What did Trump say about the election, about whether he knew he had lost? So this is really remarkable. Mike how Pence, thinly is he going to slice that, though, Ellie? Because is right. he going to think, well, if Trump says just throw out the yep, votes, yep. is that his job or is that facilitating a crime? Exactly, I mean, that's not your job. Exactly the question that, that I have, because— Pence may have an argument. He goes, look, all of this, all of Trump's conversations with me or, or most of them were about how I was going to execute my duties standing at that podium on January 6th. He, you know, he was trying to prevail upon me or his lawyers were trying to prevail upon me to read my powers a certain way. So some of this, a lot of this executive privilege uh, has to, it, it's just question by question and that's messy, but- Right. We'll see if when Pence goes in front of prosecutors, if they disagree, if prosecutors think, no, 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 this is outside of those, they may have to go back to the judge. So so that, yeah, so right. So we're going to maybe see, well, Could we see may round see two. him going back to the judge or we might, or he might just be like, okay, now no one can blame me for yes. pulling up if it's, the Yes, if boss. this is a political thing where Pence really has no prop, which it may well be, where Pence really has no problem testifying, he just needs to put on the show that I fought this. And he, he's claiming he won. He kind of did win to a minor degree. Um, mm -hmm. Then it may be good enough and he may be willing to go in there and, and yeah. So I'm going to go back into the book because uh, I love uh, <laughs> I love the colorful names and stories about organized crime. That's <laughs> um, probably I'm not the only one. Uh, that's why you know Godfather and and Goodfellas yeah. are popular movies. Um, and I want you to to tell me about about Gene the Carpet the shakedown victim, and why you compared him to certain to certain people uh, who were close to Donald Trump. Gene the Carpet, oh my goodness. Okay, so first <laughs> of all, I dealt with a lot of good mob nicknames. I completely object to Gene the Carpet because why do you think they called him Gene the Carpet? He worked at a carpet store. I mean, they're so creative, but he's not a carpet, folks. <laughs> He's not the carpet. So I always thought that was idiotic. Like you could call him Gene the Carpet Guy or Gene the Carpet Hold the phone. I just realized he was a carpet. They walked all over him. Oh, that's true. And I'm pretty sure from memory, I have a visual of the guy. He wore a pretty bad toupee. So maybe that was it. Um, oh my God. I never actually thought about that before. Ooh, I just Hello, had a breakthrough. we're breaking some news here. I just had a, a, an epiphany. <laughs> yeah. But he did work at a carpet store too, I will say. So Gene the Carpet was an extortion victim of our defendant. Our defendant was a very powerful, soft-spoken, but scary um, Queens-based mobster named Ciro Perone. And Ciro Perone, by the way, I just, just for no reason I have to tell you this, was this small statured, handsome guy. He was about 85 years old um, who controlled this entire neighborhood in Queens. He was a capo, a captain in the Genovese family. And the man was very stylish. He wore a blue leather jacket to trial, like a blue, like a cool looking blue leather jacket. And he was always tan year round. And the FBI agent <laughs> said, when we would surveil Ciro, even if it was November in Queens, he would be sunning himself. Like he had that mirror thing under his chin. You know I what I mean? I fucking love it. This yeah. is incredible. Yeah. So that's our defendant. Our defendant is Ciro. Ciro's been shaking down Gene for years. Gene has to pay him, I forget the amount, but hundreds of dollars every week just so Gene's store doesn't Protection. get burned. Yeah. Protection money. Protection money. And Gene admits this to us, to the FBI. And so we bring him in as a witness. And before he's about to take the stand, he utterly panics, crying, hysterical, I don't remember anything. He didn't pay me any. I never paid him anything. And we're like, no, you have to get out there. You're testifying and you're going to say the same thing you told us originally. And he tried to get out on the stand and say, he admitted that he paid, but then he tried to say, but it wasn't an extortion. It was just because he was my friend and I respected him. It's like, okay, I have a lot of people who I'm friends with and respect. I don't pay them hundreds of dollars. A, Speaking a week. of which, where's my check? <laughs> it's true. It's a, it's coming. It's a little light. It's a little light this week, but it's Otherwise, I'll make it up next week. Those tweets are going to be really mean. Yeah, I'm going to make gonna it up be... next week. Um, okay, thanks. So Gene <laughs> basically told us the truth, got scared, and then he tanked it or tried to tank the case. Now, luckily, right. the jury saw through it, and, and we convicted Ciro, and we had other counts too. 
I compare Gene in the book to Mark Meadows and Kevin McCarthy because <laughs> I know, right? But as I say in the book, Kevin, Kevin McCarthy and Mark Meadows have way better hair than Gene, but they're really, and they wear nicer suits, but they're really the same because both Mark Meadows and Kevin McCarthy have obviously have very important, relevant information about January 6th. Kevin McCarthy said originally, Donald Trump bears responsibility and Kevin McCarthy said, Donald Trump told me privately that he bears some responsibility, which is very valuable evidence and information. Right, this is the days after the yes. insurrection. Yep. This is for that brief period where it looked like Lindsey Graham and Kevin McCarthy were actually going to cut bait on Donald Trump until everything turned back. Now, Kevin McCarthy, a few weeks after January 6th, goes down to Mar-a-Lago, kisses the ring, poses for this gauzy photograph with Trump, gets his life scared within an inch of him, not physically, but because he wants to be speaker. Kevin McCarthy, I write in the book, the only thing Kevin McCarthy wants in life is to become speaker. He has to have Donald Trump. Look how actually that played out. He got yeah. what he wanted, and, and it was because of Trump, largely. So yes. McCarthy, after his little visit with Trump, changes his tune, like Gene the Carpet, and now it becomes... He doesn't remember, and he changes the subject, and he says, um, he, he turns right to talking points, and whenever he gets subpoenaed, he ignores the subpoena, um, and, you know, he blew off subpoenas from uh, from the January 6th committee, as did Mark Meadows. Mark Meadows never got charged for contempt, even though Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro did. Now Jack Smith, to his credit, has gone back and actually subpoenaed Meadows and fought for that and won. Actually, it's interesting that Jack Smith has, nobody has subpoenaed Kevin McCarthy or Jim Jordan, both of whom we know talked to Trump on January 6th. So my point is, all three of these guys, Gene the Carpet, Mark Meadows, and Kevin McCarthy, all had very important testimony and information about a crime. All three of them originally came forward with it, got the crap scared out of them by the powerful figure, and then curled up into a ball and pretended they didn't know anything. It's unbelievable. I, hey, I want to ask, I don't know if you've caught the news this morning um, the, the uh, about uh, ProPublica yeah. just put out a story. And, um, you know, I think the spoiler alert is uh, there's not much that can be done legally, I think, about this. Um, yeah. Unless, I don't think it ri rises to the level of anything like wire fraud, unfortunately, and I think that there's no enforcement mechanism. But the story is that um, apparently uh, Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice, was not fully uh, disclosing all of the travel and uh, travel for leisure as well as use of a private plane for, it seems like, work-related uh, travel um, in the required disclosure documents. And yeah. it's quite substantial. Um, and, you know, there, there's a painting where he's uh, featured in this painting at this billionaire's place um, where there's also right in the painting a, picture, uh, a portrait of Leonard Leo t having in conversation with him, which is the guy who's behind, I think, the the you know the net the network of I use it with the Federal Society, but I think he's also behind the network that supposedly helps fund getting sub conservative Supreme Court justices hmm. through the system. Mm -hmm. um, what oh. this reminded me of, it seems like it, it, the only thing that the article is alleging is that this is a disclosure violation, right? Because um, as we all know, paying for access um, in and of itself is not a federal crime. Um, and so I don't know if you want to talk about yeah. this piece or if you also want to, to pivot a lot to the trouble with prosecuting public corruption after yeah. both uh, the, the McDonnell as well as the Bridgegate, the Kelly case. Sure. Um, the, the Thomas case, look, I, I've gone full-blown Supreme Court. I went from skeptic to cynic to nihilist. I mean, I just think they're- <laughs> I, I just, I'm with you. Yeah, oh my I God. just think they're all completely in the bag. Every resolution has is not, you know, in law school they teach you, it's like a math equation. You take the inputs, you multiply X by Y, Whatever comes out as the answer is the answer, whether you like it politically or not, whether you like the outcome, whether it's liberal or conservative or whatever. Right. All of them, I'm now convinced, start at the bottom line and then backfill the, the, the calculation. Um, and they're completely unaccountable. The rules of ethics do not apply to this, literally do not apply to the Supreme Court justices. All other federal judges have to follow them except Supreme Court justices. Um, Thomas, this seems to be yet another violation. He took massive gifts, failed to report them. Um, he, he just, the thing is, as you say, there's almost nothing that can be done. You can't file a lawsuit. That's not going to get anywhere. He can be impeached, but that's theory only. He'll never be impeached. Um, um, 
and Justice Chief Justice Roberts isn't ever going to force him to do anything. And I don't know that a chief justice could force him. What he should have done is A, just A, not take these gifts, B, disclose them, and C, on a separate note, recuse himself from January 6th because his wife's direct involvement in some, not necessarily, she didn't storm the Capitol, but she was at the rally. Right. She's coordinating right. with, with Mark Meadows. She's texting. She's pressuring state legislators. And Clarence Thomas doesn't do any of it, and he doesn't give a crap. And he's basically just flips the bird to all of us and says, what are you going to do? And the answer is, there's not much. Um, I also talk, yeah, I, I talk in the book about if you are angry at the other side when it comes to the Supreme Court, if you're a conservative and want to blame liberals, if you're a liberal and want to blame conservatives, here's one area where you can be angry at everybody, <laughs> exactly. which is the way that the, the one of the very few areas where the Supreme Court has achieved unanimity over the last decade or so, is in narrowing down the scope of our public corruption laws. It starts with the case you mentioned, Jennifer, against Virginia Governor Bob, uh, Bob, McDon Bob McDonnell, who was convicted by a jury. The conviction was upheld by the Court of Appeals, and then the Supreme Court threw it out, nine nothing. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg agreed with right. Justice, uh, you know, with, with Justice Kennedy and Justice Thomas on this one, and they argued that in that case. What happened was a guy who had this weird um, nutritional supplement based and wanted the, the Virginia and the governor to promote it basically gave Bob McDonald and his family, similar to this, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gifts, cash, loans, watches, travel. And McDonald, uh, in turn, pulled all these levers behind the scenes for this guy, ordered cabinet officials to meet with him, hosted a reception at the state right. house, that kind of thing. And the Supreme Court said, no. It's got to be a more tangible official action like casting a vote or vetoing or something. And can I just stop for you for yeah. one second? What bothers me the most about this case is that they construed, they, just, they all decided it was fine to use the bribery of public of federal public official statute. Right. 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 They didn't strike As down a the reference. law. And he's not even a he's not even a federal official. They he was really being he was really being charged under the shakedown statute. And nothing in that statute mentions official act. Anyway, I'm, right. I'm getting a little bit into the weeds, but right. it's making me it makes me so angry. So yes. the point is, they said, uh, well, if he, the Supreme Court said, well, he set up some meetings and he gave orders to his cabinet members to take a look at things, but he never vetoed anything. He never cast a yes or no vote in a, in, a, in a legislature or anything like that. So only those latter areas count, which basically means, go ahead, everybody, give all the gifts you want, get all the access you want. Go ahead, politicians. You can pull whatever strings behind the scenes you want. You can set up meetings, you can make recommendations, but you just can't actually cast that vote because of it. Right. Um, and then- a couple years later in uh, New Jersey, here, my home, uh, th the Bridgegate convictions were thrown out. This is the scandal where several of Chris Christie, then Governor Chris Christie's staffers, were charged with basically shutting down access lanes to the George Washington Bridge as political retribution. And the court found, yeah, this was politically motivated and it's grotesque, but it doesn't. It, it also does not meet our, our corruption statutes. And that was the honest services. Statute, honest services, right. Honest yeah. services has to be like a financial element and not just sort of politically motivated dirty pool. And again, that one was eight to zero. I think, I guess this was after Justice Scalia died, but before Gorsuch replaced him. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, it's not often you're going to see Justice Sotomayor uh, uh, in, on the same page as Justice Alito, but it happened in these two cases. So, um, But you make the yeah. excellent point that Congress has had a long yep. opportunity to amend those statutes. Now it's possible, I think that they have a better chance of amending the bribery statute. Um, I yep. wonder if the honest services statute you know, that has been, we, we, well, look, they haven't even tried to amend the law yeah. to make it more difficult for public corruption to continue. There's a curious lack of interest and enthusiasm in Congress for uh, amending the laws to make it clear that we mean these to apply broadly. They seem to be just perfectly fine with the new narrow constructions of those laws. So, yes. And, you know, I quote at the end a, of that chapter, a friend of mine who's been a, a corruption prosecutor for decades. And he said to me one time, very frustrated, he said, at this point, we can never charge a public official with anything unless we have a videotape of the guy accepting a cash envelope marked cash for votes. Anything short of that, we're and not, not just votes, cash for votes on this piece of legislation. Right. And let me, and, and exactly. And Jen, you know, I, I want to throw this at you. There's not an answer. It's a little bit of a trick question, but, but I've asked this of several friends of mine. Merrick Garland, and, and part of it is, is his fault and part of it is because of the way the law is. Merrick Garland has now been the Attorney General of the United States for two plus years. And he has at his disposal 10,000 plus federal prosecutors, 93 U.S. attorney's offices, um, serving 94 districts. People sometimes, because one, I think Guam and Virgin Islands share an office actually. Yes. Um, yes. And 
He has all of the assets of the FBI, U.S. attorney's offices. Who is the most powerful political person who Merrick Garland has charged with anything? Well, I'm just thinking there, there well, there was that, per, there was the, uh, that guy who just uh, didn't show up for his wire fraud case and they, then he was shot by the FBI. He, but he's okay, not that right. High. That guy was a, right, a, a, a chief of staff to a governor or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm trying to think, is there anyone else? I mean, was there, um, maybe some corporations? I mean, I, right. I don't really. But my, my point is like, he has not charged I can't any, think of any individuals. He has not charged any person with any sort of, any sort of politically powerful person with any oh. sort of corruption crime. Somebody said to right. me, maybe it was, I think it was maybe Mimi, who's our our mutual friend, Mimi Roca said uh-huh. something about like a New York lieutenant governor candidate or something. I said, okay, well, if that's your answer, then, then that answers my question, which is like, yeah. nobody in any position of power meaningful power has been charged with, I, I mean, it can't be that nobody, no powerful person in this country has committed a federal corruption offense for the last two and change years. I, I'm skeptical of that notion. So I'm not saying he's, you know, being, doing anything corrupt. I'm just saying it's hard to find it. It's hard to charge it, especially if you don't really have the appetite for it. Right. No, it's true. Um, so I got on my my questions about, you know, in the final part of your book where you're, it's kind of, I call it your fantasy indictment yeah. and you kind of go through the different fact patterns and how you charge them. I really love um, that you think about the Racketeering, Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, yeah. which people know as the acronym RICO. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, I, I wonder... Um, I wonder if you can describe why it's such a nice tool for prosecutors to use and why you think it will never be used against Donald Trump. Well, I I actually (laughs) do think Fonnie Willis may use the Georgia state version of it. We have reporting along those lines. Um, RICO is is a valuable tool for prosecutors because it allows you to charge somebody as part of a larger organization engaged in a pattern of criminal activity, more than one criminal act connected to one another and connected to the organization. It allows prosecutors, and I used to charge this all the time, to give the full picture of what was going on, how this group operated on a systematic level. There's also other practical effects. You can charge older conduct. You can charge conduct that happened in other jurisdictions. Um, And most importantly, it allows you to nail a boss even if you can't show the boss committed the crime with his own hand, if you can show he's part of that enterprise and he knew they were doing this kind of thing. So it, it really expands the bases on which you can charge and convict a boss. And I actually, I argue in the book, it, it would have an extensive application to Donald Trump. And I do think Fonnie Willis may charge it in connection with the effort to um, overturn the 2020 election results in Georgia. But it, it's been underutilized. I should say in the book, I do lead off, I forget if it's count one or two of my mock indictment of Donald Trump with the Stormy Daniels hush money payments. Yeah. Um, but I will say, I th- I argue it should have been charged under federal law by the feds. I think there are actually substantial problems legally and maybe factually with the way that it's now been charged under state law by the Manhattan so DA. So talk about that since that's yeah. right, in, right in front of us now. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to say about that? As we so, the, the charge up? under state, it's not a, it's not a crime to, to pay hush money. It's not a charge. It's not a crime to right. know about hush money. The state law crime is an awkward fit because you have a misdemeanor for falsifying business records, right? So you have to show not just that records were falsified, but Trump knew or Trump ordered that the records be uh, that the payments be categorized in the documents as legal fees, right? Or cause them to be cause or right. cause them to be exactly. Um, we know they were categorized that way. I think there's a pretty good case that Trump knew and was in on it, but that's just a misdemeanor. In order to get that up to a felony, you have to prove that the records were falsified in order to commit or conceal some second crime. And now Alvin Bragg, who's, I should say, a friend of mine and a former colleague, um, has not specified in the indictment what those second crimes are. He doesn't technically have to, but he will have to eventually, and he should have done it right away. Instead, you have to sort of, what people are left to do is go through this statement of facts and try to like, it's like a law school exam, like pull out the issue spot. And that's not the way, look, an indictment, let's be fair here. Indictment is meant to serve notice on the defendant. Here's what you're charged with. Here's what you're defending yourself against. But Alvin, in his in his press conference, mentioned three possible other crimes. One is federal election law. Problem is, this is in state court. He's going to have a legal problem there. Now, I don't. We don't know how it's going to come out. It's unresolved. But you don't want to go into a case like this with unresolved issues of law. Second is it's a violation of New York state election law. 
but it's a race for president, which is a federal election. It's not governed by New York state election law. And third is this convoluted tax theory, which doesn't really emerge in the documents. And various people in the Times recently have tried to piece it together, but nobody can seem to articulate what it is. If anything, we know they overpaid Michael Cohen to cover his tax liability. Right, the true up. But the question is whether that was still a false statement on his tax return. I guess, but it's a false in that he's overpaying. That's weird. Um, (laughs) I don't know that I would, as a prosecutor, I I don't know that I would feel great about charging that. Um, so, and there's a possibility that they, they, that the Trump organization itself, um, treated this as um, an expense. Yeah, or deduction, right. We don't know that for sure. It's um, all, all the money is all added together, so it's hard right. to probably but know. My point is, under under state law, you have all these legal obstacles that you wouldn't have had under, under federal law. Right. It would have been a much cleaner shot under federal law. That is for absolute sure. Yeah. Uh, before we go, I want to yes. say, like, your paperback, <laughs> um, um, Untouchable, comes out probably next year, but by then... You're not going to really have much of a new introduction. I mean, you're going to have this indictment. Yeah. You think you're going to have a few more, but you're not going to have any trials yet. <laughs> no, I know, right? I'm going to have to add a chapter, as you always do. But a lot of it has come <laughs> true. You know, I will say, I'll tell you, I'll give you a little publisher, you know, behind the scene book process. When I wrote this, I was thinking, well, Trump might get indicted before this book comes out. It came out two months ago and change. And so there's several points in the book where I say, by the time you're holding this, Donald Trump may well have been indicted. I do say in the book a couple of times, I say most likely by Fonnie Willis in, in Georgia. I noticed that. So, um, <laughs> you know, I was half right or more than half right, but um, but we wanted, and so I, I do write the book from the perspective of even if Donald Trump gets indicted, which is likely, there's a lot of obstacles that, that lay ahead. And, and I think it's important that people understand those. Well, I want to I want to thank you so much for spending this time in your very busy day before you you head off to the television studio. Um, before we leave, uh, is there anything I forgot to ask you? Um, and is there how do people find you uh, besides on CNN all the time? So uh, one of the great things about having a weird name like I do, Ellie Honig, is I'm the <laughs> only one. So you know, sometimes if someone's uh, you know if someone's Jim Franklin, they might be Jim Franklin 11 or Jim Frank. I am the only Ellie Honig, E-L-I-E-H-O-N-I-G. I'll, I'll close real quick. I'll tell you the story of my name. Do you know this, Jen? Have I told you? I don't know it. I want to hear okay. it. Okay. Uh, my birth name was Eliezer. I was named after, I mentioned my grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor. My grandfather on that side was also a Holocaust survivor who died before I was born, 1960. His name was Lizer, um, with, you know, Polish, Jewish name. I was named Eliezer, which is a very, you know, Eliezer, Lizer is a variation of that. And, but you're not going to, like, that's a lot to call a little kid, you know, Ellie, a four, four <laughs> syllable name. So everyone called me Ellie. My parents called me Ellie. And I went through school, but I started, when I went into school, I started to always get confused for a girl. I get put in the girl's teams. I got one time I played on a soccer team and everyone got trophies of a dude and I got a trophy of a girl with with boobs and, and long hair. Um, and at the time, this would make me very <laughs> upset. And so when I was 10 years old, my dad, who was a lawyer, said, do you want to change your name legally to Elliot for when we sign you up for summer camp? I was about to go to summer camp. I was just like, yes, please. So we changed it to Elliot. And it's funny, to this day, my friends from summer camp still know me, still call me Elliot, which is bizarre to me. They've now, I think, mostly come back. But um, so we legally changed it to Elliot. I only ever used Elliot at summer camp. I kind of had two lives going on as a kid. <laughs> and then I would come home and be Ellie. Um, and then when I became a lawyer, I asked my mom, I said, hey, can you go grab that file from when I went to camp and we changed my name. It was from 1985. And my mom found it. And I went to court in DC where I was practicing at the time. And I legally changed my name back to Eliezer. And I um, I sent the papers to my parents, to, to my dad, to surprise him because uh, it was his father. And so I'm back to Eliezer. And then when my wife and I got <laughs> married, um, they one of the questions on the on the paperwork is, have you ever been known by another name? And I wrote, yes, Elliot and Eliezer. And they said, okay, uh, well, we're going to have to list you as an AKA and also known as, which so, <laughs> I see you're covering your mouth in shock. <laughs> so, so our wedding certificate says Eliezer Honig, AKA Elliot Honig and Rachel Honig. And I said, you know, we were both prosecutors. I said, gosh, I feel like I'm a defendant with the AKA here. I so, hope the ketubah in like Hebrew says AKA also. Well, the it's beautiful so thing of it is my Hebrew name has always been Eliezer. We've never changed ah, that. So, so cute. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so I'm the only Ellie Honig. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and all that. Um, and uh, yeah, this was great. Thank you, Jen. It's, oh, oh, it's such, a, so such a pleasure to talk to you always. And uh, good Pesach to you. Thank you. You too. All right.
That was such a great conversation. I wish he could have stayed longer, but he has a day job. So there's that. Um, One thing I wanted to talk with Ellie about, and I can share now, is just how thoughtful um, and compelling the book was because he is brutally honest. And I'm going to read you a passage. Um, So, you know, as you know, the book is called Untouchable. um, And it essentially is an accusation or an acknowledgement that some people walk through the world entirely or nearly above the law. And so here's what he says on page 130. Prosecutors generally think harder and require more proof before they'll bring a charge against a boss than against a common defendant. It's not comfortable to acknowledge. The standard boilerplate prosecutor talking point goes something like this. We consider every case with precisely equal care and apply the same standards across the board, regardless of the defendant's station in life. But that simply is not true. So gems like that and uh, and others in this book, there's so much to learn. I highly recommend it. Thanks so much for listening. And I will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send me an email at bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write on real paper with ink and everything at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast.